Hi everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this important session, which is specifically for all the FMG students who are going to appear for their exam in January. Now I can see many of you are live now. Now, uh, but your your exam was postponed. Your exam was scheduled for third of December, and now it is postponed. So consider this time. as an opportunity to complete your targets all those subjects which you weren't able to complete and you wanted you get some extra days to complete those topics this is the time when you are going to complete all those subjects make the most of this time this is a very very good opportunity for all of you you know this one and a half month which rather abhi to you have two months so this one and a half to two months which you have you are going to use them very very carefully and you are going to see time is the most valuable asset which all of you have got you are not going to waste your time you are not going to now think that i am quitting that is not an option for you all rather this is an opportunity where you can all of you who are listening who are watching this session can believe can stray say to yourself with conviction ki now this one and a half to two months i have got extra i am going to clear my exam this time right i believe in all of you and i'm sure you will also believe in yourself rather this is what i want you to do to believe in yourself i want you to focus on your goal and don't look in any other direction but ahead that is the only thing which you have to do keep on moving take those small small steps and ultimately those small steps will you take you to the other side of the exam i want all of you to clear this exam which is going to happen in january and in order to help you in understanding what are the important topics for obs and gyne i have brought this very important uh, session now in this session what is planned in this session i am going to you know discuss with you some very important mcqs so many times you people are confused that there are sessions for ini set there are sessions for neat pg and you are confused that hame kitna padhna hai how much do we people have to study kya hame sare updates janne hain now this is session which is specifically for you all where i am going to tell you what updates you people need to know and believe me there are going to be questions which are going to come definitely sure shot in your fmg exams from the questions which i am going to take up today right not only this in this session i am going to show you some important spotters i will be discussing those scores in obs and gyne which you need to know and towards the end of the session i will be dividing entire obs and gyne into three parts right part 1 will be the one suppose abhi tak you have not started uh, obs and gyne do you know completing obs you have not started or you haven't completed obs and gyne this list which i'm going to provide you is going to act as a benchmark for you list one may the topics which i'm going to give you you are those are the topics which you are going to first focus on once you complete those topics of list one then you are going to go to list two and just in case you don't have any time just do list one and list list two ke topics that is more than enough but if you have time then go to list 3 which i am not going to tell you what is list 3 the remaining topics come in list 3 right this is going to happen towards the end of the session so coming to uh, the first question now as per who parameter for seven analysis of 2021 the following parameter remains unchanged now i don't know how many of you people know who ke seven analysis parameters have changed initially the parameters which i have been teaching you they were the ones which were given in 2010 
and now 2021 may the pa new parameters have come and your question is which of the following parameter remains unchanged and i can see you have started answering excellent anand prasan sibgoth solanki all of you have answered this question very well and the answer is sperm morphology right so this over here is who's 2010 parameters and over here is who's 2021 parameters जो 2021 के सीमन एनालिसिस के पैरामीटर्स हैं दे आर बेस्ड ऑन फिफ्थ परसेंटाइल इससे क्या मतलब है दिस मींस दैट दीज आर द पैरामीटर्स व्हिच आर मिनिमम दिस नंबर रिप्रेजेंट्स मिनिमम व्हाट इज नीडेड फॉर कंसेप्शन दीज आर नॉट द एवरेज वैल्यूज सो सीमन वॉल्यूम सीमन वॉल्यूम अकॉर्डिंग टू 2010 पैरामीटर मिनिमम सीमन वॉल्यूम नीडेड फॉर a uh, conception was 1.5 ml now it is 1.4 ml now tell me quickly if there is no semen what is the term called as no semen is called as aspermia right number 2 second parameter is total sperm number now total number of sperms and this is minimum which is needed for conception that is 39 million Uh, sperms and just that also remains unchanged unchanged total sperm number is 39 million again now tell me what do you ask and i mean what is the term which is used for decreased sperm count what is the term which is used for decreased sperm count decreased sperm count is oligospermia right oligospermia means when the sperm concentration is less than 15 million per ml and if sperm concentration is less than 5 million per ml that is called as severe oligospermia and what is the term which is used for no sperms in semen so no sperm in semen is azoospermia clear now total mortality total mortality according to 2010 parameter was 40% now it is 42% progressive mortality was 32% earlier now it is 30% please remember what do you call the term uh, what is the terminology used for decreased sperm mortality the terminology used for decreased sperm mortality what is the terminology that is asthenospermia so you are going to tell me one very important condition in which you get asthenospermia in which condition do you get asthenospermia quickly write down in the comment box and let me know in which condition do you get asthenospermia asthenospermia you get in which syndrome in immotile cilia syndrome which is called as cartagener's syndrome right cartagener's syndrome now tell me in which two very important conditions you get azoospermia please remember azoospermia you are going to get in cystic fibrosis right and in klein felter's syndrome in cystic fibrosis and klein felter's syndrome clear to all of you that is the reason why whenever you get azoospermia you should get a you know a karyotyping done to rule out klein felter's syndrome clear now non progressive mortality 1% that is the criteria both last uh, 2010 criteria also and 2021 criteria immotile sperms 22% now it is 20% vitality 58% and now it is 54% normal forms 4% and now still it is 4% so morphology remains unchanged total sperm number remains unchanged in the 2021 criteria another very important question is suppose there is a and this is something which you people you know tend to make mistakes suppose if there is a report of azoospermia after how much time should you get a second 
a semen analysis done to confirm a zoospermia so you should get a second time semen an semen analysis done to confirm a zoospermia minimum after one week time and best is after one month now the confusion here comes jab question ye pucha jaye ki there was a problem in semen analysis because of which some drug treatment was given and because drug treatment was given now they ask you that after how much time should you repeat a semen analysis to see whether the drug has worked or not now in this type of question remember that the total time taken for spermatogenesis is 70 to 74 days that uh, so it is basically 72 days and the range is 70 to 74 days best answer is 72 days and after that once spermatogenesis occurs then the sperm is going to take time to move in the ductal system in the male ductal system so if you have given a drug and you want to see whether its effect is coming or not a repeat semen analysis should be done after 3 months right but if the report is azoospermia and you want to confirm azoospermia then the repeat semen analysis should be done minimum after 1 week best is after 1 month is this clear to all of you yes okay then there is one more criteria which has been added in the new semen analysis and that is semen odor earlier this criteria was not there now this criteria is there right so this is the new semen analysis who's 2021 semen analysis very very important question right so this was an update which i have given you in the form of a question coming to a second question very important is hpv vaccines that is again a very very important topic for all the fmg students all are true with respect to hpv vaccine except option a it is prepared from l1 capsid protein option b serva vac is bivalent option c as per who's sage recommendations females with age more than equal to 20 are given two doses option d hpv dna testing is not done before administering administering the vaccine so option a it is prepared from l1 capsid protein option b servavac is bivalent option c as per who's sage recommendations females with age more than equal to 20 are given two doses option d hpv dna testing is not done before administering the vaccine i can see all of you answering and most of you have answered it as option d which is incorrect option d is the wrong answer only one has answered it correctly and that is anchal sharma that is servavac is bivalent please be very careful they are asking servavac right this is not cervix vaccine right this is not your cervirax vaccine right it is servavac which is given to you in options over here it's not cervirax vaccine cervirax vaccine is bivalent but servavac that's the first quadrivalent vaccine which is being prepared by india it's the india's first uh, hpv vaccine which is being prepared by rather it has now been prepared by serum institute of india in pune and this servavac vaccine is a quadrivalent vaccine which is active against hpv 6 11 16 and 18 right so do not confuse servirax with servavac servirax is bivalent servavac is quadrivalent remember all hpv vaccines are prepared from l1 capsid proteins right till now we had only three vaccines servirax gardasil and gardasil 9 servirax is a bivalent vaccine gardasil was a quadrivalent vaccine and gardasil 9 was a nonavalent vaccine 
for all fmg exams it is very important to uh, remember or memorize all the nine strains against which gardasil 9 is active right so 6 11 16 18 31 33 45 52 52 52 and 58 right now cervirax what is active as a bivalent vaccine which is active only against hpv 16 and 18 and so it can protect only against cin and cancer cervix whereas gardasil was also active against 6 and 11 so it can protect against genital warts and cancer cervix gardasil 9 can protect against genital warts and all six cancers which are caused by hpv so what are all six cancers which are caused by hpv number 1 cancer cervix number 2 cancer vulva number 3 cancer vagina in females number 4 in males oral cancer penis cancer and ano genital cancers so gardasil 9 can protect against all nine all six cancers and it is a non avalent vaccine ideal age to give hpv vaccines is 11 to 12 years right till now it was said that hpv vaccines can be given only between 9 age to 26 that was the age group but now there is an extended age group and the extended age group in high risk females is 27 to 45 years so if a gynecologist feels that a female comes in high risk category for cancer cervix what are those females or who are those females who come in high risk categories all those females who are immunocompromised all those who have multiple sex partners all those who have sexually transmitted diseases right all those who had early men uh, early coitarchy right or who had early childbirth so these are the category of females who come under high risk category females for cancer cervix another what are the other risk factors for cancer cervix smoking is one risk factor for cancer cervix and oral combined pills is another risk factor for cancer cervix right please remember that early menarche and late menopause are risk factors for endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer right in case of uh, cancer cervix early menarche and late menopause are not risk factors it is early coitus early age of intercourse and early age of childbirth which is a risk factor for cancer cervix right now so now the extended age group for giving hpv vaccines is 9 to 45 years ideal age still remains the same 11 to 12 years right ideally hpv vaccines should be given before a female begins her sexual activity but that doesn't mean that if a female has become sexually active and she has not taken hpv vaccine then we are going to contraindicate in her no hpv vaccines can be given to sexually active females this is a common myth which all of us have that it cannot be given to sexually active females number 2 it can be given to females who have present or past history of hpv infection this is the reason why hpv testing is not needed before giving the vaccine right so hpv testing is not needed that's a very very important point which you have to remember that before giving hpv vaccine you don't have to do any hpv test right the vaccine is contraindicated in pregnant females it is safe during lactation and its most common side effect is syncope now this again is something which is now a days being asked till now we were saying that conventionally hpv vaccines should be given as three doses to all those females who are more than 15 years and to females and males who are less than 15 years you should give two doses but recently there is a who sage recommendation on which a question has been asked in ini set and in neat both that what is the who sage recommendation for hpv vaccines who sage recommendation said you see when cancer covid came it was a very aggressive movement against covid that all the vaccines were so easily and readily available but as far as cancer cervix is concerned the vaccines number one are not very readily available because of the high cost 
and that is why india has now manufactured its first vaccine first hpv vaccine which is sarvavac right and number 2 uh, was the dosing schedule because three doses had to be taken that is why in many females you know they were not even taking these vaccines because of the cost factor and because of the dosing factor so recently who said that if you are giving this vaccine to a female who is between 9 to 20 years you can give either one or two doses and in females who are more than 20 years you have to give two doses right so now they have said that in general population there is no need to give three doses of this vaccine three doses kis mein deni hai to in which category of females you have to give three doses you have to give three doses only if female is hiv positive then only you have to give three doses otherwise if the female is more than 20 years of age two doses less than 20 years of age one or two doses is that clear right so this is very very important hpv vaccines and everything about hpv in itself that's very very important right so what is uh, you know which is the most common hpv which can lead to cancer cervix that is hpv 16 right which is the most specific hpv which leads to cancer cervix that is hpv 18 which hpv leads to squamous cell carcinoma that is hpv 16 which hpv is most commonly associated with adenocarcinoma that is hpv 18 right now from which uh, protein is a uh, vaccine prepared from l1 capsid protein which viral proteins are needed for viral replication e1 and e2 which viral proteins are needed for uh, you know for um, oncogenicity which are responsible for its oncogenic nature they are e6 and e7 clear so these are very very important questions on hpv which all of you should be knowing right okay then coming to a third question which is again related to cancer cervix and that is as per who the target age for screening of cancer cervix is so tell me as per who the target age for screening of cancer cervix is option a 21 to 49 years option b 21 to 65 years option c 30 to 65 years option d 30 to 49 years again i am getting varied answers for this question which clearly shows that um, now either it shows that you are not a maro subscriber right or if you are a maro subscriber you have not done edition 6 revision videos because if you would have done edition 6 revision videos you would have answered this question correctly again i got the answer correct only from one person pat your back anshul sharma from my side give yourself a chocolate from my side excellent the answer is 30 to 49 years right now remember that the screening for cancer cervix if you are a maro subscriber and you have read edition 5 notes till edition 5 we were talking only about acog screening for cancer cervix recently who gave its guidelines for screening of cancer cervix in resource limited country and we are a resource limited country so who ki jo guidelines hai for screening of cancer cervix that goes with us so we are going to follow who's guidelines for screening of cancer cervix so remember that according to who the age to start screening for cancer cervix is 30 years whereas according to acog it was 21 years right age to stop the screening is 50 years whereas according to acog it was 65 years so the target population for uh, for who for screening as uh, advised by who for screening of cancer cervix is 30 to 49 years and so the answer is 30 to 49 years right this is who's protocol for screening of cancer cervix which is there specifically for resource limited countries 
Now, WHO has advised for resource limited countries that there are two approaches for screening. Number one is a see and treat approach. And number two is a see, triage and treat approach. See and treat approach ka kya matlab hai? See and treat approach ka matlab hai that you, when a patient comes to you for screening of cancer cervix, you are going to do a primary screening test and that primary screening test as advised by WHO is HPV DNA testing. So whenever I am going to do screening for cancer cervix, which I am going to begin at 30 years of age, I am going to do HPV DNA testing. If HPV DNA testing comes out to be positive, I am not going to do any confirmatory test. Straight away, I am going to treat my patient either with cryosurgery or with LLETZ or LEAP. What is LLETZ? It is large loop excision of transformation zone, right? So we take a copper wire, we pass electric current through it and we excise the entire transformation zone. Why are we excising the transformation zone? Because the most common site for cancer cervix is transformation zone. What is the most common variety for cancer cervix? squamous cell carcinoma, right? But then can adenocarcinoma also occur in cervix? Yes, it can happen in cervix. So if someone asks you what is the most common site for adenocarcinoma of cervix, the most common site for adenocarcinoma of cervix is endocervix. Clear to all of you? Up samaj mein aaya ki when you are doing pap smear, why do you take two samples? One sample you are taking from transformation zone with the help of Ayer's spatula. Because transformation zone pay, the cancer which is most commonly going to happen will be squamous cell cancer. And number two sample you are taking with the endocervical brush. And endocervical brush se sample kaha se lenge? From endocervix. Why we are taking it from endocervix? Because adenocarcinoma ki most common site is endocervix. Right? So coming back to WHO's screening approaches. WHO kehta hai ki in resource limited countries, there can be two approaches. One is a see and treat approach. See and treat approach may the primary screening test is HPV DNA testing. Please remember WHO pap smear nahi keh rahe. WHO is not saying that you have to do a pap smear as a screening test. WHO is saying that in a country like India, you have to do the screening test, HPV DNA testing. Why is WHO not saying pap smear as a screening test? Because pap smear ka result ke baad, always you have to do colposcopy before you can treat a patient. Balki WHO rather is saying ki you do a screening test and treat. And pap smear kabhi bhi hume result mein, in pap smear, you know, whenever you do a pap smear, always it has to be followed by biopsy. That is why WHO says don't do pap smear in a country like India. Go for HPV DNA testing. If it comes out to be positive, treat your patient either with cryosurgery or with LLETZ. Now suppose it comes out to be negative. HPV DNA testing comes out to be negative. Then after how much time are you going to repeat HPV DNA test? You are going to repeat HPV DNA test in general population after 5 to 10 years and in HIV positive population in 3 to 5 years. Right? This is one approach. Second approach. Second approach which is given by WHO is C triage and treat approach. C triage and treat approach may WHO kehta hai that you do a primary screening test. The primary screening test is HPV DNA testing. If it comes out to be positive, go for a secondary screening test and the secondary screening test is VIA. What do you mean by VIA? Visual, V stands for visual, I for inspection, a for acetic acid, visual inspection with acetic acid. And if VIA also comes out to be positive, then you go for treatment. That is C triage and treat approach. So 
in a nutshell according to who best is c triage and treat approach that means best is you do hpv plus via but if that is not given in the options then the second best is hpv alone and the third best is via alone is that clear to all of you who does not recommend pap smear as a screening test because if pap smear comes out to be positive it is always it should be followed by colposcopic biopsy and if that also comes out to be positive then you do treatment kabhi bhi hum pap smear ki report ke basis pe treatment nahi karte you never do treatment based on pap smear report right on the other hand acog kya kehta tha acog said that screening test which you should do is pap smear and when should you start doing the screening test at 21 years of age you should repeat pap smear after every 3 years till a female becomes 30 years of age when a female is 30 years of age then along with pap smear do hpv dna testing and you should repeat it after every 5 years till 65 years of age if in previous 10 years pap smear report was normal or till 75 years of age if in previous 10 years pap smear was abnormal right so these are again very very important recommendations which have been given by who you have to remember who protocol you have to remember acog protocol in your exams they are going to ask you know they are going to give you whether they are talking about acog protocol or whether they are talking about who protocol if they ask you what is being done in india in india we have to follow who's protocol clear okay next very very important topic which is a recently overall screening test for cancer cervix you cannot say ki overall there is a best screening test for cancer cervix no uh, but just in case suppose solanki if a question comes like this you are going to answer as per this what i have given you overall best is hpv plus via if that is not given in the option then second best is only hpv if that is also not given then third best is via what is leap leap and lletz are one and the same thing lletz stands for large loop excision of transformation zone L E E P stands for loop electro excisional procedure. So suppose अगर आपके पास question आता है, what is the management of C I N two or C I N three in any age at any parity? अब वो कंफ्यूज करने की कोशिश करेंगे दे विल से शी इज अ ग्रेविडा थ्री ग्रेविडा फोर ग्रेविडा फाइव फिफ्टी फाइव इयर्स फीमेल राइट वॉट इज द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ चॉइस चाहे वो ग्रेविडा थ्री हो टू फोर हो फाइव हो वन हो नो मैटर वॉट इज द ग्रेविडा नो मैटर वॉट इज द पैरिटी मैनेजमेंट ऑफ सी आई एन टू एंड सी आई एन थ्री ऑलवेज इज लीप और एल एल ई टी जेड यू नेवर डू हिस्ट्रेक्ट मी right you are never going to do hysterectomy for cin2 or cin3 cin1 ka kya management hota hai cin1 ka management is you have to wait and watch for 2 years 2 years mein most of the time cin1 will automatically regress but if cin1 persists beyond 2 years right so if it persists for more than 2 years then you go for cryo surgery or cryo ablation clear ha uh, your doubt cleared okay now coming to as i was telling you another very important cancer which recently has uh, you know taken a lot of importance in all your exams whether it is neat whether it is uh fmg exam whether it is ini set that is vulva cancer 
you can expect one question from vulva cancer so all are true about vulval cancer except option a squamous cell keratinizing type is the most common variety option b most common hpv associated with it is hpv 16 60% cancers occur at clitoris option d single most important prognostic factor is lymph node status so i can see various answers again b there is a confusion between b and c to most of the students so confusion chal raha hai some people saying b some most of you saying c chalo quickly let us uh dr gurjar this video is going to remain but only those students who have the link will be able to watch it again if you don't have the link to the session you will not be able to watch it again right so first important thing most common variety for vulval cancer is squamous cell cancer right that's the most common type of vulval cancer ab ye jo squamous cell cancer hota hai which is the most common variety it has two types warty type or keratinizing type keratinizing type is 60% cases warty warty is 40% cases now warty type is more common in young females between 55 to 60 years keratinizing is more common in older females that is between 65 to 70 years warty is unifocal keratinizing is multifocal warty has a good prognosis keratinizing has a bad prognosis warty type of squamous cell cancer is associated with hpv now this was a question in i ni set this year risk factors for vulval cancer hpv most common hpv associated with it is hpv 16 followed by hpv 33 right then smoking and vin right vulval intra epithelial neoplasia keratinizing is not associated with hpv it is associated with lichen sclerosis squamous cell hyperplasia and mutation in gene p53 most common age group for cancer vulva is post menopausal age group and as i told you keratinizing is most common that is why keratinizing ka age group most common hota hai and that is more than 65 years of females may this is seen vulval cancer most common symptom for vulval cancer is pruritus for diagnosis of vulval cancer keys punch biopsy is done management of vulval cancer in stage 1 and stage 2 is surgery in stage 3 and stage 4 it is chemo radiation right now please remember that the first lymph node which is involved in vulval cancer is superficial inguinal lymph node and that is the sentinel lymph node for vulval cancer iske baad the lymphatics will go into deep inguinal lymph nodes that is femoral lymph nodes that is why when we do surgery we have to do surgery in terms of two things surgery for the cancer and surgery for lymphatic spread right so cancer ke liye bhi surgery karni hai jo lesion hai uske liye bhi surgery karni hai and lymph nodes ke liye bhi surgery karni hai now because the lymphatic drainage of vulva is first into inguinal and then into femoral to lymphatic spread ke liye you will have to do inguino femoral lymph node dissection inguino femoral lymph node dissection right the only thing which you have to remember is that if tumor size is less than 2 cm and it is less than 1 mm deep so if size of the tumor is less than 2 cm and it is less than 1 mm deep so in that case there is no need for inguino femoral lymph node dissection 
then there is no need for inguinofemoral lymph node dissection. But, but otherwise, you will have to do inguinofemoral lymph node dissection for vulva cancer. Now, as far as cancer is concerned, uske liye surgery kaun si karenge? Uske liye you can go for modified radical vulvectomy. They can be radical vulvectomy. So there are various types of surgeries like radical vulvectomy or modified radical vulvectomy. That is a little bit more detail. I don't expect them to ask you these things. But yes, as far as a vulval cancer is concerned, small, small things you will be asked. And this much what I have told you, I feel this should be more than enough for you. You can also go for a radical local excision. Right. So this much, if you know on vulval cancer, this is more than enough for you people. Right. Then the other thing is spread for vulval cancer. Spread for vulval cancer. It can be direct spread, lymphatic spread or hematogenous spread. Prognostic factor. The single most important prognostic factor is lymph node involvement. And the second is depth of the lesion. As I told you, if the depth of the lesion is less than one millimeter, there is no lymph node uh, involvement will be there. And that is why lymph node dissection is not needed. Right? Clear to all of you? This much, if you know, it's more than enough on vulval cancer. So squamous cell keratinizing type is the most common variety? Yes. Most common HPV associated is HPV 16? Yes. 60% 60 cancers occur at clitoris? No. What is the most common site for cancer, vulva cancer? Most common site for vulva cancer is labia majora and labia minora. In 60% cases, vulval cancer will involve labia majora and labia minora. Single most important prognostic factor is lymph node status? Yes. Clear to all of you? So please remember the age group for vulval cancer. Types of vulval cancer, risk factors for vulval cancer, prognostic factor for vulval cancer, and some basic about the management of vulval cancer. If you remember this much, that's more than enough. Between majora and minora, if they ask you which is the most, most common site, most common site is majora, right? So, now, now, coming to the next question, again, this is one of those questions where, you know, these days they have uh, started asking you about hormonal ch changes in various conditions. So this is something which you have to be very, very well aware of, right? So you have to tell, match the clinical conditions with the correct hormonal profile. PCOS on one side, Asherman syndrome. Kalman syndrome and Turner's syndrome. And on the other side, you have various hormonal profiles. Now, before all questions like these, just quickly remember some important basics. This over here is hypothalamus, right? Hypothalamus releases GnRH in a pulsatile manner. GnRH is going to act on anterior pituitary. From anterior pituitary, two hormones are released, FSH and LH, right? FSH and LH act on ovary. And from ovary, estrogen is released. And from ovary, progesterone is released, right? Estrogen and progesterone act on the uterus from where bleeding happens. So all this cycle, this entire pathway, which is the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, entire thing is needed for a female to menstruate properly, right? Now, there are certain problems which you have to remember related to hypothalamus. Hypothalamus ki ek problem which you have to remember is Kalman syndrome. Kalman syndrome may there is hypothalamic failure. So there is going to be decreased GnRH. 
because there is going to be decreased gnrh there is going to be decreased lh decreased fsh decreased estrogen right plus there is anosmia in kalman syndrome right now remember estrogen has a negative feedback on fsh always estrogen will have a negative feedback on fsh progesterone in low concentrations has a positive feedback on lh in high concentrations it has a negative feedback on lh right till here it is understood by all of you so in kalman syndrome a female is going to have less lh less fsh less estrogen and there is going to be anosmia now the main hormone which is needed for breast development is estrogen that is why in kalman syndrome patient is going to come to you with complaint of primary amenorrhea because this pathway is not working properly so there is going to be no menor uh, no menstruation and she is going to come to you with complain of absent breast development in other words delayed puberty right so yahan pe ab dekho calvin syndrome for calvin syndrome what do you need you need low lh low fsh low estradiol right so this is the hormonal profile for kalman syndrome right then comes the hormonal profile related to pituitary what are the problems which can happen in pituitary which can alter the hormonal profile so pituitary se related there can be hyperprolactinemia hyperprolactinemia when can will there be hyperprolactinemia if there is a prolactinoma right to so, jab bhi prolactinoma hoga ya hyperprolactinemia hoga prolactin has a negative feedback on gnrh again because it has a negative feedback on gnrh there will be decreased lh there will be decreased fsh and there will be decreased estrogen clear to all of you this is going to happen in case of hyperprolactinemia hyperprolactinemia ya prolactinoma mein patient is again going to come to you with complain of amenorrhea and along with that kyunki it is a prolactinoma prolactin secreting tumor there will be increased breast secretions right and because prolactin is a tumor of the pituitary there is going to be headache and visual disturbances clear to all of you pituitary se related ek aur cheez ho sakti hai and that is she han syndrome in she han syndrome there is necrosis of anterior pituitary gland so all the hormones which are formed by pro, uh, anterior pituitary decrease so there is decreased prolactin there is decreased lh decreased fsh and obviously if lh and fsh are decreased there will be decreased estrogen now because prolactin is decreased so this female is going to come to you with complain of inability to breastfeed the baby in ability to breastfeed the baby right and because of decreased lh and fsh there is going to be amenorrhea so if there is amenorrhea along with headache visual disturbances and increased breast secretions it is prolactinoma if it is amenorrhea along with inability to uh, breastfeed the baby then that is shehan syndrome so these are the two things which you had to remember with respect to pituitary with respect to ovary ab ovary se related you have to remember two very important conditions one is premature menopause premature 
menopause, which these days is called as POI. What is POI? Primary ovarian insufficiency. Primary ovarian insufficiency is a new name for premature menopause. So in case of premature menopause, again, there will be decreased. Okay. So what is going to happen in case of premature menopause? There are no more follicles in the ovary. Right? Is pathway mein problem nahi hai. Problem ye hai ki now there are no follicles in the ovary which can secrete estrogen or progesterone. Right? The problem is not in pathway. Now, because there are no more follicles in the ovary, so in spite of this pathway working, there will be decreased estrogen, there will be decreased progesterone. Right, because there are no more follicles which can secrete estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen has a negative feedback on FSH. Now, because estrogen has a negative feedback on FSH and because estrogen is less, the negative feedback on FSH is gone. So, there will be increased FSH. Progesterone has a negative feedback on LH. Now, because there is no progesterone, the negative feedback on LH is gone. So, there will be increased LH. So, this is the condition which you get in case of premature menopause. Decreased estrogen, decreased progesterone, increased LH, increased FSH. Please remember this, that in premature menopause, LH, FSH will be high. Estrogen and progesterone will be less, right? Then, in case of ovary, there can be another situation. That is PCOS, ovaries related PCOS. PCOS ka, I want all of you to remember this. In PCOS, there is an ovulation. Because of this an ovulation, there is decreased progesterone, number one. Number two, when we talk about estrogen, when you are talking about estrogen, estrogen can be normal. Or it can be increased. In obese females, it is increased. In thin females, it is normal. Right? When it comes to LH and FSH, FSH is normal. LH is high. So this is something which I want all of you to remember for PCOS. In PCOS, FSH levels are normal. LH levels are high. Right? Both LH, FSH high nahi hote. It is FSH which is normal, LH which is high. Progesterone is decreased because of anovulation. Estrogen can be normal or estrogen could be increased. It is increased in obese females. Right? A bot typical thing which you get in PCOS is that androgen levels are high. They are high but they are less than 200. Clear? All of you, yes, LH is to FSH ratio becomes 3 is to 1 in PCOS patients. Normally, this ratio is 1 is to 1. In PCOS patients, this becomes 3 is to 1, right? Then comes your uterus-related problem, which is Asherman syndrome. Now, in Asherman syndrome, the entire pathway is normal. Problem is that there are uterine additions. So, in Asherman syndrome, there is no problem in the axis. The problem is that there are uterine additions. So, estrogen is normal. Progesterone is normal. LH is normal. FSH is normal. Right? The other thing which you have to remember related to ovary is there can be streak ovaries. Streak ovaries are seen in Turner syndrome. Now you tell me if there are streak ovaries or non-functioning ovaries, what is going to happen? Again, if there are non-functioning ovaries, what is going to happen? So, there will be no follicles and again, if there will be no follicles, estrogen will be less, progesterone will be less. 
so lh will be increased fsh will be increased clear to all of you yes the last thing which you have to remember because all these hormones are something which trouble you a lot what happens in pregnancy in pregnancy placenta is going to secrete form estrogen so estrogen will be high placenta and corpus luteum are going to form progesterone so progesterone will be high and because estrogen is high so there will be negative feedback on fsh so fsh will be decreased and lh will be decreased so remember jo condition menopause mein hoti hai uska opposite happens in pregnancy right so if you remember these many hormonal conditions all your questions related to hormones will be solved so let us go back to this question and see pcos so what is going to happen in pcos in pcos as i told you lh is high fsh is normal estrogen is normal right asherman syndrome mein everything normal lh normal fsh normal estrogen normal turner syndrome mein estrogen will be less progesterone will be less so lh and fsh will be high right so i hope all these hormones things are clear to you this is very very important this is the recent way in which they have started asking questions and i expect that in fmg also they are going to ask questions based on hormonal profiles right okay another very very important topic now please uh, show me a thumbs up if till here it is clear to all of you quickly show me a thumbs up if this is clear to all of you now coming uh, i am waiting for your thumbs ups okay great now uh, match the vaginal discharge with the likely cause vaginitis is again a very very important topic for your upcoming fmg exams so you have to match the vaginal discharge with the likely cause so candida may what is the kind of discharge which you get madi i am not going to repeat it again beta what you can do is once this session is come over you can come back to this uh, watch this video again at a slower speed and you will understand right okay so match the vaginal discharge with the likely cause so over here uh, just a few very very important things which i want to tell you about vaginal discharges i am sure this topic you are well versed with but still quickly let's do trichomonas may whenever you are going to get a patient with trichomonas she is going to come to you with complaint of frothy yellowish colored discharge the ph of the discharge will be more than 4.5 pruritus will be present dysuria will be present so there will be pain during micturition and you are going to get red vagina like strawberry so that is strawberry vagina whenever you get a patient of candida the patient is going to come to you with curdy white scanty discharge so in case of candida problem is not of discharge problem jo patient hamare paas lekar aati hai that is pruritus she is more concerned about pruritus rather than discharge right and there is dysuria the ph of the discharge very important to remember is that in candida the ph of the discharge is less than 4.5 in bacterial vaginosis patient comes to you with a grayish white or yeah, off white colored discharge with no pruritus but it is foul smelling and whiff test is positive whiff test positive means when you add 10% potassium hydroxide you get a fishy odor investigation of choice whenever a patient comes to you with vaginitis is saline microscopy on saline microscopy in case of bacterial vaginosis you are going to get clue cells right now in case of trichomonas what is the drug of choice in case of trichomonas the drug of choice is metronidazole it is a sexually transmitted disease and that is why partner treatment should be done in trichomonas in case of candida the drug of choice is fluconazole but please remember if your patient is 
pregnant. Then in that case, you have to give topical imidazoles like clotrimazole. In that case, you don't give oral fluconazole. In that case, you give topical clotrimazole, right? In case of candida, it can be a sexually transmitted disease. So only if your partner has uh, symptoms, then partner treatment is necessary. Otherwise, partner treatment is not necessary. Bacterial vaginosis is just a, you know, alteration in vaginal flora. It is not an STD. The drug of choice for bacterial vaginosis is metronidazole or clindamycin right and for bacterial vaginosis you don't have to give any partner treatment the typical thing about bacterial vaginosis is that there is no inflammation so there is no pruritus clear another very important thing which at this point of time i want you to revise is that there is something which is called as syndromic management of vaginal discharge for syndromic management of vaginal discharge the kit which you have to give is kit number two which is a green kit and in this green kit there is one tablet of fluconazole and one tablet of secnidazole there is no metranidazole there is secnidazole so one tablet of fluconazole 150 milligrams and one tablet of sec Nidazole, two grams. Now, whenever you are doing syndromic management of vaginal discharge, partner treatment is not given, right? What was WIF test was that when you add 10% potassium hydroxide to the discharge, you get a foul or a fishy odor, right? And WIF test is positive in case of bacterial vaginosis. Now, you should also remember syndromic management of PID. According to NACO guidelines, our National AIDS Control Organization guidelines, for PID, we have to do least investigations and give the patient treatment. So whenever a patient comes to me for with PID, with suspected case of PID, I'm going to take her history. Most commonly, she's going to give me history of lower abdominal pain or she may give me history of vaginal discharge, abnormal uterine bleeding, urinary symptoms or secondary dysmenorrhea. But mostly there is going to be lower abdominal pain. So when I'm going to do examination, if I get uterine tenderness or adenexal tenderness or cervical movement tenderness. Now, whenever you get cervical movement tenderness, you have to think about two things. Either it can be a case of ectopic pregnancy or it can be a case of PID. So do a urine pregnancy test. If urine pregnancy test is positive, probably you are dealing with ectopic pregnancy. If urine pregnancy test is negative, then you have to go for PID as the diagnosis. So the syndromic diagnosis banti hai, that is lower abdominal pain syndrome. So if your patient has lower abdominal pain and along with this, any of these, you know, along with lower abdominal pain, any of these uterine tenderness, adnexal tenderness or cervical movement tenderness, then you make a diagnosis of lower abdominal pain syndrome. And for managing lower abdominal pain syndrome, you give yellow kit or kit number six to the female, right? This kit number six has got doxycycline, cefixime and metronidazole. Now, whenever you make a syndromic diagnosis of lower abdominal pain syndrome, you don't only have to give a kit to the partner, to the female, that which is kit number six, yellow kit. You also have to give treatment to the partner and to the partner, you are going to give kit number one, which is gray kit, which has got azithromycin and cefexy. If they ask you in which other conditions do you use gray kit, gray kit is used for managing urethritis cervicitis, anorectal discharge and scrotal pain syndrome. So partner treatment of PID may use karte hai. along with that urethritis may be used karte hai, cervicitis may use karte hai, anorectal discharge may and scrotal pain syndrome may be used kit number one which is grey kit. So in gynae you have to remember three kits, yellow kit, green kit and grey kit or the rest of the three kits you have to remember for dermatology and you will read it in your dermatology lectures right so you have over here i told you kit number two that is green kit is for vaginal discharge kit number three uh sorry kit number six that is yellow kit which is for your managing a female patient with pid and kit number one 
that is gray kit that is for partner treatment of PID. Along with that, it is also used for managing urethritis, cervicitis, scrotal pain syndrome and anorectal discharge. Clear? Very, very important are these kits. So over here, it's written Candida. Candida mein kaisa discharge milega? Candida mein you are going to get a thick, scanty, non-foul smelling discharge with itching. Right? In bacterial vaginosis, the discharge will be foul smelling but without any itching. Right? In trichomonas, you are going to get yellow with itching and dysuria. Now coming to physiological discharge. Again, before I go to, you know, the other question, I'll come, I'll come back to this question. I am going to the other question and that is a one question that is characteristic of physiological discharge are, you have to tell me what are the correct answers here. One is scanty, two associated with dysuria, three non-pruritus, four foul smelling. So tell me which options correctly describe a physiological discharge. A, B, C or D. A is 1 and 3, B is 1 and 4, C is 3 and 4, D is 2 and 4. Tell me. Okay. So I've started getting answers. Most of you are saying it's option A. Right. So remember, physiological discharge, when it comes to color, it will be colorless. Right, so options may ya to colorless likha hoga ya white likha hoga. Right, number one. Number two, when it comes to odor, it will be non foul smelling. Right, number three, when it comes to pruritus, there is no itching. So just now we see, saw that bacterial vaginosis discharge was also white in color. And it was not associated with itching, but bacterial vaginosis ka discharge was foul smelling. Over here, this is like bacterial vaginosis, but it is non-foul smelling. Then comes quantity. A quantity depends upon the time at which physiological discharge is happening. If this is happening in first half of the cycle, then it will be profuse under the effect of estrogen. And if it is happening in second half of the cycle, it will be scanty. So physiological discharge ke aage scanty bhi aa sakta hai. Physiological discharge ke aage profuse bhi aa sakta hai. Right? Physiological discharge could be profuse, it could be scanty, depending upon the time at which it is happening. But the two very important characteristics of physiological discharge are that it is not associated with any itching. And it is non-foul smelling. So it can be scanty. Yes. Is it associated with dysuria? No. Is there any pruritus? Yes, there is no pruritus. Is it foul smelling? No. Right. So over here, one and three are the correct options. That is option A is the right answer. Clear to all of you? Okay. So same thing you got in this question also. Physiological discharge, non-foul smelling, thin copious. Now that depends upon the, uh, the time at which it is happening. If it is happening in first half of the cycle, it will be profuse, right? It will be thin. It will be watery, right? It will be elastic. It can be stretched. But if it is happening in second half of the cycle, it will be scanty. It will be thick. Right? It will be non-elastic. So that all depends upon the time of the cycle it, uh, in which it is happening. Right? I'm sure all of you know the phenomena of spin bar keat. What is spin bar keat? Spin bar keat is stretching of cervical mucus. And when does this happen? This happens in first half of the cycle under the effect of estrogen. Right? Okay. Next question. Next question is a very oftenly repeated question and that is composition of mala N. 
please remember mala n and mala d they have the same composition they have 35 micrograms of estrogen that is ethanyl estradiol and 0.15 mg of levonorgestrel so 35 micrograms of ethanyl estradiol and 0.15 mg of levonorgestrel what is the difference the difference is mala n is no cost it is distributed free of cost by government of india mala d is available at a subsidized rate right another very important thing which i want to tell you is jab bhi hum ocps ka oral combined pills ka classification karte hain and whenever we say first generation pill second generation pill third generation pills the generation is told in terms of progesterone right so when we say first generation pills it means that the pill has got first generation progesterone second generation pills second generation progesterone now i don't want you to remember all the generations what i want you to remember is what are the progesterone which come in third generation and which are the progesterones which come in fourth generation is pe questions are asked third generation progesterones are gestodine disogestrel etonorgestrel and norgestimate why am i saying that you need to remember third generation progesterones this is because progesterone have androgen like action right and all of us know ki pcos ke patient mein if a pcos patient is having irregular cycles we will give ocps for hirsutism we give ocps and i am saying that progesterone has androgen like action so if progesterone has androgen like action we shouldn't be giving it to a patient with pcos now the thing is that as the generation increases in progesterone the androgenic side effects keep on decreasing this is the reason why third generation progesterone have least androgenic side effects and fourth generation are एंटी एंड्रोजेनिक तो जब भी पीसीओएस का पेशेंट आएगा एंड हमें उसे ओरल कंबाइंड पिल्स प्रिस्क्राइब करनी है आई एम गोइंग टू चूज फ्रॉम थर्ड जेनरेशन प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन और फोर्थ जेनरेशन प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन एंड दैट इज वाई क्वेश्चन आर आस्ट टू यू दे कैन आस्क यू दैट अ पेशेंट ऑफ पीसीओएस वॉज हैविंग हिरसुटिज्म वॉट इज द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस सो ऑल ऑफ यू नो दैट द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर हिरसुटिज्म is ocps ab they can go a step further once in your exams ocps may be unhone do option likh diye the one was ethanyl estradiol plus levonorgestrel other was ethanyl estradiol plus disogestrel and that is where this knowledge comes in handy to you ki jab bhi pcos ka patient aayega i am going to give ocp but i have to choose an ocp where progesterone belongs to third generation or fourth generation so gestodine disogestrel etonorgestrel and norgestimate are third generation progesterones and cryptoterone acetate and drospirenone are fourth generation progesterones now second classification of ocps is based on estrogen content agar estrogen ka amount is more than equal to 50 micrograms we call it as high dose pills these days we do not use high dose pills लो डोज पिल्स का मतलब है कि ईस्ट्रोजन इज लेस देन 50 माइक्रोग्राम्स दैट इज इट इज जनरली बिटवीन 20 टू 35 फाइव माइक्रोग्राम्स वेरी लो डोज मीन्स लेस देन 20 माइक्रोग्राम्स द लोएस्ट पॉसिबल डोज ऑफ ईस्ट्रोजन व्हिच कैन बी सीन इन ओरल कंबाइंड पिल्स इज 10 माइक्रोग्राम्स एंड दिस इज अ न्यू पिल विच हैज कम बाय द नेम ऑफ लोएस्ट्रिन लोएस्ट्रिन में जो ईस्ट्रोजन का कंपोनेंट होता है दैट इज लेस देन 10 माइक्रो 10 माइक्रोग्राम्स और लेस 10 माइक्रोग्राम्स सॉरी नॉट लेस देन 10 डोंट प्लीज डोंट रिमेंबर दैट इट्स 10 माइक्रोग्राम्स इट हैज द लोएस्ट पॉसिबल ईस्ट्रोजन कंटेंट एंड दैट इज 10 माइक्रोग्राम्स राइट सो लो डोज पिल्स मींस लेस देन 50 very low dose मींस लेस देन 20 लोएस्ट पॉसिबल इज 10 माइक्रोग्राम्स clear to all of you 
Another very important question which they ask you on OCPs is what is the main mechanism of action of OCPs? Please remember the main mechanism of action of OCPs is it brings about an ovulation. Right, that is the main mechanism of action of OCPs. OCPs pay another question which they ask you is which of the following are absolute contraindication of OCPs? Very, very important question. Absolute contraindications of OCPs, uh, see, as far as contraceptives are concerned. I don't want you to rely on the information which is given in PARC. PARC may updated nahi hai. If you are a Maru subscriber, you are going to follow what I have taught you in your lectures. If you are not a Maru subscriber, this is the list which I'm going to give you. You are going to remember this list of absolute contraindications for OCPs, right? So let me first tell you the list and then I'll come back to this question. So for remembering the absolute contraindications of OCPs, remember the mnemonic banks have various schemes to provide home loans during May, where B stands for a known or suspected case of breast cancer. H stands for uncontrolled severe hypertension. So remember, mild hypertension is not an absolute contraindication. Uncontrolled severe hypertension where systolic BP is more than equal to 160, diastolic more than equal to 100 is an absolute contraindication, right? Then V stands for undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. S stands for smoker more than 35 years of age. So, agar koi female ki age 35 and she's not smoking, then that's not an absolute contraindication for OCPs, right? Only if she's a smoker and her age is more than 35, then that's an absolute contraindication for OCPs. T stands for a known or suspected case of thromboembolism or if there is family history of idiopathic thromboembolism or if there is history of coronary vascular accidents, MI or conditions predisposing to it. Right. Then P stands for pregnancy or if there is history of peripartum cardiomyopathy. H stands for severe hypercholesteremia or hypertriglyceridemia. L stands for impaired liver function at present. Past history of liver disease is not a contraindication. Presently, if there is liver disease or liver cancer, hai, that's a contraindication for OCPs. D stands for diabetes with vasculopathy. Simple plain diabetes is not a contraindication. Right. But yes, diabetes with vasculopathy is an absolute contraindication. Similarly, plain, simple migraine is not a contraindication. Migraine with aura or migraine with focal neurological deficit is an absolute contraindication. Clear to all of you? Yes. OK. So with this background, tell me, which of the following are absolute contraindications of combined oral pills? Number one, arterial or venous thrombosis history. Yes or no? Quickly type in, in your chat box. Yes or no? Arterial or venous thrombosis history is a, is a contraindication. Yes. Severe hypertension. Yes. Gestational trophoblastic neoplasias? No, that's not a contraindication. Diabetes with vascular complications? Yes, that is a complication. So one, two and four, that means option B is the correct answer for this question. Clear to all of you? Yes? Okay. Remember, contraceptives may, one more thing is very, very important for you. One is IUCD, copper IUCD, don't forget to read it. Mirina is very important. And emergency contraception is very, very important, right? Achha. Another absolute contraindication for OCPs is in a breastfeeding female and in a female who is less than 21 days postpartum, irrespective of whether she is breastfeeding or not. Agar female is less than 21 days postpartum, 
then you are not going to give ocps now suppose i say she is not breastfeeding so there is a female who is not breastfeeding can non breastfeeding females may can you give ocps you can give ocps but after 21 days why not before 21 days because ocps have got estrogen plus progesterone estrogen kya karte hain estrogen increase karte hain clotting factors ko so estrogen increase the clotting factors pregnancy in itself is a hypercoagulable state that is why even if the female is not breastfeeding till 21 days after delivery i am not going to give ocps clear to all of you right so these were important points important topics which i wanted to tell you in excuse me in gyne now coming to a few important questions in ops all are true about abruptio placenta except abruptio placenta that is antepartum hemorrhage is a very very important topic for all of you right so option a folic acid deficiency is a risk factor option b on per abdominal examination uterus is rigid and tender and patient presents per vaginally with bleeding option c per vaginal examination is contraindicated option d termination of pregnancy is the management in case of abruptio so what is the answer i have started getting answers from all of you you people don't have many confusions in this question there is no confusion here all of you are very clear of jessie menica all of you are very clear galat answer aana start ho gaye now you have started giving me wrong answers the correct answer is option c right option b is right please or correct answer the over here answer is option c so remember folic acid deficiency is a risk factor yes folic acid deficiency is a risk factor for abruptio placenta now all those who are maro subscribers or who have attended my live teaching you know that i make this lady everywhere for remembering risk factors for abruptio placenta right so uh, we have a female over here there is increase maternal age of this female and increase maternal parity right she is smoking so their cigarette smoking is a risk factor cocaine abuse is a risk factor now but chum risk factors generally they never ask you per se right but there are four topics jisme risk factors pe direct questions aate hain placenta previa ke risk factors pe direct question aayega in abruptio you are going to get direct question on uh, risk factors in pih you are going to get direct question on risk factors and in pph in charo ke in all these four conditions risk factors have to be on your fingertips right other than that risk factors pe questions nahi aate hain generally you get questions related to risk factors from these four topics right so now this female has folic acid deficiency because of which she has callosus around her lips so folic acid deficiency then in blood vessels there is high bp high sorry high bp that is pih and thrombophilia a risk factor related to abdomen is abdominal trauma risk factor related to uterus is twin pregnancy polyhydramnios premature rupture of membranes and fibroid uterus right so twins may polyhydramnios hota hai polyhydramnios say membranes can rupture now when membranes are going to rupture the entire amniotic fluid is going to come out suddenly so the size of the uterus will shrink suddenly and jump size of the uterus will suddenly shrink so the placenta which was attached to the uterus will get detached right so these are risk factors related to abruptio so yes folic acid deficiency is a risk factor right on per abdominal examination in case of uh, uh, abruptio uterus is rigid 
tender and patient presents with per vaginal bleeding that is absolutely right in case of placenta previa uterus is soft in placenta previa uterus is soft and relaxed where and there is no pain in abdomen whereas in case of abruptio patient is going to present to you with pain in abdomen and with bleeding beyond 28 weeks of pregnancy is per vaginal examination contraindicated no in case of abruptio per vaginal examination is not contraindicated it is in case of placenta previa that per vaginal examination is contraindicated in case of abruptio once you have ruled out placenta previa you have to do a per vaginal examination why am i saying you have to do this is because abruptio ke patients mein when the placenta separates when the placenta separates from the uterus thromboplastin is released right and ye jo thromboplastin release hota hai ye patient ko labor mein le jata hai and because ye patient ko labor mein le jata hai i need to see how much is the cervix dilated right so in case of abruptio you have to do a per vaginal examination but it should be done after ruling out placenta previa yehi thromboplastin hai jo uterus ko tensed banata hai एंड टेंडर बनाता है यही थ्रोम्बोप्लास्टिन है विच लीड्स टू डी आई सी एज अ कॉम्प्लिकेशन सो डी आई सी इज अ कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ एब्रप्शियो डी आई सी इज नॉट अ कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ प्लेसेंटा प्रिविया देन टर्मिनेशन ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी इज अ मैनेजमेंट इन केस ऑफ एब्रप्शियो यस इन केस ऑफ एब्रप्शियो बिकॉज प्लेसेंटा हैज स्टार्टेड सेपरेटिंग so the best management is termination of pregnancy although i am now going to share with you the updated management of abruptio this is the updated management iske baad just now i'm going to share with you updated management i want all of you to keep the updated management of abruptio also in your mind so answer to this question is option c right so over here सपोज आपके पास क्वेश्चन ऐसे आता है कि देर इज अ जी टू पी वन प्रेगनेंट फीमेल हु हैज कम टू यू एट थर्टी फोर वीक्स हर बीपी इज वन फिफ्टी बाय हंड्रेड टेन देर इज पेन एंड अपडोम एंड ब्लीडिंग पीवी एंड दे आस्क यू वॉट इज द नेक्स्ट स्टेप तो सबसे पहले तो आई वॉन्ट ऑल ऑफ यू टू सी दैट ब्लीडिंग इज हैपनिंग बियॉन्ड ट्वेंटी एट वीक्स एंड जब भी ब्लीडिंग होती है बियॉन्ड ट्वेंटी एट वीक्स whenever bleeding is happening at more than equal to 28 weeks you have to think about abruptio or you have to think about placenta previa or in rare circumstances they can be vasa previa right then in case of abruptio on per acha you are going to get history of trauma ya pih अगर प्री डिस्पोजिंग फैक्टर में ट्रॉमा या पी आई एच दिया इट मीन इट इज गोइंग मोर इन फेवर ऑफ एप्रप्शियो इन प्लासेंटा प्रिविया एंड वासा प्रिविया ऐसी कोई हिस्ट्री नहीं मिलती राइट देन सपोज योर क्वेश्चन से इज दैट देर वॉज ब्लीडिंग विच हैपेंड एंड देन इट स्टॉप्ड एंड दो दिन बाद अगेन पेशेंट स्टार्टेड ब्लीडिंग सो देर इज रिकरेंट ब्लीडिंग so whenever you get history of recurrent bleeding in the question that two days back patient had bleeding then it stopped and then it started again then think about placenta previa then don't think about abruptio don't think about vasa previa then if pain in abdomen is given whenever pain in abdomen is given you have to think about abruptio you don't have to think about placenta previa or vasa previa then on per abdominal examination in case of abruptio uterus will be tensed it will be tender it will be rigid height of the uterus is more than the period of gestation and most of the time fetal heart sounds mein ya to distress milega ya death milega right this is because of the concealed variety of abruptio whereas in case of placenta previa uterus will be relaxed uterus will be non tender 
uterus will be soft height of the uterus will be equal to period of gestation and fetal heart sounds will be normal vasa previa hum kab suspect karenge vasa previa aap tab suspect karoge in your questions if your question says that arm was done artificial rupture of membranes hua tha ya membranes rupture hui automatically and suddenly there is the fetal heart rate drops down and there is bleeding to so membrane rupture ke baad fetal heart rate dip kar gaya and bleeding hui that means you are dealing with vasa previa membrane rupture ke baad keval fetal heart rate drop kiya that means you are dealing with cord prolapse right so whenever your question says that there is bleeding plus there is fetal distress which happened immediately after uh, membrane rupture that means vasa previa clear to all of you yes okay now in this question clear cut they are talking about abruptio and whenever they are talking about abruptio and they ask you the next step then see ki kya question mein have they given you any emergency condition like fetal distress dic ya question mein diya hai ki maternal vitals are unstable in that case your next step becomes immediate cesarean section right ya question mein diya hai ki abruptio hai and abruptio ke andar fetal death has happened now if fetal death has happened and vitals of the patient are unstable the next step is immediate cesarean section if fetal death has happened but vitals of the patient are stable then the next step is induction of labor now suppose abruptio ka scenario hai and nothing no emergency situation is given mother ke vitals bhi stable hai fetal heart sounds normal hai no emergency condition then look at the gestational age if gestational age is more than 34 weeks your answer will be induction of labor don't say cesarean section induction of labor and if it is less than 34 weeks expectant management clear so in case of abruptio overall thumb rule is ki induction of labor ya termination of pregnancy should be done but then induction of labor karenge ki cesarean section karenge that depends upon what further information is given to you in the question one very important thing which i want all of you to note that if you are a maro subscriber and if you have read edition 5 in edition 5 i told you that if there is a patient with abruptio and dic then i told you first correct dic followed by vaginal delivery ki kabhi bhi dic ke patient mein cesarean nahi karte now the new recommendations have come and that is if a patient has dic and there is abruptio then you have to correct dic and do cesarean section now the say in a patient of dic you don't go for vaginal delivery if abruptio is present is this point clear to all of you note this point because i'm sure some of you are not watching edition 6 revision videos and that is why you are not well versed with these things which are happening which these updates which i have given in edition 6 now please remember expectant management of placenta previa ka naam hai mccafe and johnson regime abruptio ke expectant management ka there is no name rather expectant management is something new which has come in abruptio right till now we said that we don't do expectant management in abruptio so mccafe and johnson regime which all of you are writing in the comment box that is expectant management for placenta previa and not for abruptio clear to all of you yes okay coming to a next question so a 34 year old g2p1 at 31 weeks of gestation presents to the labor and delivery with complaints of vaginal bleeding which happened earlier in the day and then resolved on its own as i told you is type ki jo typical history hoti hai that bleeding was present and now it has resolved this is a typical history which you get in patients of placenta previa right 
so she is 31 weeks coming to you with bleeding which stopped that day there is no leakage of fluid no uterine contractions she reports good fetal movements in her last pregnancy she had a cesarean section she denies any medical problems her vital signs are normal electronic external fetal monitoring shows fetal heart rate is reactive no uterine contractions which of the following is the next step in management so this patient is coming to you with antepartum hemorrhage right and uh, most probably she is a case of placenta previa but then i have to confirm that she is a case of placenta previa and in order to confirm that she is a case of placenta previa what am i going to do i am going to do ultrasound please remember per vaginal and per speculum examination is contra indicated now whoever has written option a send her home since her bleeding has resolved please remember placenta previa may there is something called as warning hemorrhage which means ki placenta previa ke patient mein initially there is less bleeding and this is followed later on by excessive bleeding so without confirming that she is a case of placenta previa without doing the needful expectant management i am not going to send her back home right so option a is wrong right so whenever a patient comes to you with recurrent bleeding you always have to think about placenta previa in placenta previa per vaginal and per speculum examination are contraindicated so the next step is ultrasound ultrasound mein kaun sa ultrasound jo screening ultrasound hota hai that is abdominal ultrasound or in abdominal ultrasound i will see that the placenta is located in the upper segment or in the lower segment if placenta is located in upper segment it means it is abruptio if it is in lower segment that means it's placenta previa now once i know that it is placenta previa then the investigation of choice is tvs trans vaginal sonography remember in placenta previa per vaginal examination is contraindicated but investigation of choice is tvs why is tvs investigation of choice this is because of the new classification i don't know whether you all are well versed with the new classification or not nowadays there is no type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 placenta previa nowadays we classify placenta previa as low lying placenta previa uh, as low lying placenta and placenta previa low lying placenta ka matlab hai a placenta which reaches within 2 cm of the internal os but it does not touch or doesn't cover the internal os right so a, a placenta which reaches within 2 cm of the internal os but it doesn't touch or cover the internal os is low lying placenta previa and it, it's that's a low lying placenta placenta previa is a placenta which is at the level of internal os or it covers it a placenta which touches up till the level of internal os or covers it is placenta previa right so in case of placenta previa the mode of delivery is vaginal is a cesarean section and mostly you go for lower segment cesarean section rarely you may have to do a classical cesarean section remember classical cesarean section ka matlab hai you are giving incision in the upper segment these days we do not do classical cesarean section unless and until you cannot approach the lower segment right so in case of placenta previa because the placenta is in lower segment and if you feel that if i am going to do a lower segment cesarean section patient is going to have a lot of bleeding in that case you may do a classical cesarean section right or if there is cancer cervix then you do a classical cesarean section or if you are doing a perimortem cesarean section perimortem cesarean section means that a patient is about to die and you are doing a cesarean section then you are going to go for classical cesarean section clear to all of you otherwise we go for lower segment cesarean section that is lscs in case of placenta previa you are not going to try for vaginal delivery in case of placenta previa always cesarean section clear then 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन विच इज अ रिपीट क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम योर प्रीवियस ईयर क्वेश्चन अच्छा जायेश बेटा दिस इज रॉन्ग वॉट यू आर राइटिंग फेनेस्टील इंसिशन इज द इंसिशन विच यू गिव ऑन स्किन तो जब भी हम सिजेरियन करते हैं हमें स्किन पे भी इंसेशन देना होता है और हमें यूट्रस पे भी इंसेशन देना होता है राइट right? स्किन पे जो हम इंसेशन देते हैं जो हम लो ट्रांसवर्स इंसेशन देते हैं दैट इज अ फेनेस्टील इंसेशन राइट वेर एज यूट्रस पे जब हम इंसेशन देते हैं यू कैन गिव एन इंसेशन इन दी अपर सेगमेंट दिस इज कॉल्ड एज क्लासिकल सिजेरियन सेक्शन or you can give a transverse incision in the lower segment this is called as lscs as is incision ka naam hota hai munroker incision so kur incision kur incision right this is not a fenensteel incision fenensteel incision is the incision which you give on skin okay now an intern conduct such as who have started getting answers so d b okay let me see what it is an intern conducts a delivery immediately after delivery mother experiences breathlessness hypotension tachycardia collapse per vaginal examination is normal and there is no excessive blood loss most probable diagnosis is a postpartum collapse pe a lot of questions are being asked and whenever you get a question on postpartum collapse postpartum shock you have to think about three things either it is a case of pph or it's a case of uterine inversion or it's a case of amniotic fluid embolism now pph may primary pph will occur within 24 hours of delivery यूट्राइन इन्वर्जन जो अक्यूट यूट्राइन इन्वर्जन होते हैं दे अकर विद इन ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स ऑफ डिलीवरी एंड एमनियोटिक फ्लूड एम्बोलिज्म इट अकर्स एट द टाइम ऑफ लेबर और विद इन थर्टी मिनट्स ऑफ डिलीवरी इन पीपीएच पेशेंट इज गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट टू यू विद एक्सेसिव ब्लीडिंग तो एक्सेसिव ब्लीडिंग होगी एंड बाद में पेशेंट इज गोइंग टू गो इन टू शॉक राइट इन केस ऑफ uterine inversion you can get excessive bleeding or you can get less bleeding and patient will go into shock why because in case of uterine inversion shock jo hota hai initially it is neurogenic shock initially it's a neurogenic shock so initially bleeding less hoti hai right and later on there is hemorrhagic shock later on लेटर ऑन ब्लीडिंग ज्यादा होती है सो इफ योर क्वेश्चन एवर सेज दैट पेशेंट गोज इन टू इमिजिएट शॉक आफ्टर डिलीवरी वेन एवर योर क्वेश्चन सेज पेशेंट गोज इन टू इमिजिएट शॉक द वर्ड इमिजिएट मीन्स दे आर ट्राइंग टू पॉइंट टूवर्ड्स यू ट्राइन इन वर्जन दे मे से दैट ब्लीडिंग वॉज लेस दे मे से ब्लीडिंग वॉज मोर generally they are going to tell you bleeding is less because they want you to point towards neurogenic shock right in case of um, amniotic fluid embolism in amniotic fluid embolism there are two phases in the first phase patient has cardiac and respiratory failure ye respiratory and cardiac failure is the most important thing or the most important clue for diagnosing amniotic fluid embolism jab bhi question mein ye diya ho ki patient ko breathlessness hui and patient went into shock this breathlessness you are never going to see in pph you are never going to see in uterine inversion breathlessness ke sath agar shock mil raha hai it means it is amniotic fluid embolism now if your patient survives this phase then she is going to go into the second phase and then she is going to have tic so initially patient ko less bleeding hogi patient ko breathlessness hogi and she will go into shock later on there is going to be excessive bleeding right in per on per abdominal examination in case of pph the tone of the uterus will be absent right so uterus might not be palpable at all in case of uterine inversion you are going to get a cup like depression below the umbilicus in amniotic fluid embolism per abdominal normal no 
एवरीथिंग विल बी नॉर्मल टोन ऑफ द यूट्रस विल बी नॉर्मल सब कुछ नॉर्मल होगा ऑन पर अबडोमिनल एग्जामिनेशन इन केस ऑफ पीपीएच ऑन पर विजाइनल एग्जामिनेशन एक्सेसिव ब्लीडिंग विल बी प्रेजेंट इन केस ऑफ यूट्राइन इन्वर्जन वेन यू आर गोइंग टू डू अ पर विजाइनल एग्जामिनेशन यू आर गोइंग टू फील अ राउंडेड मास फिलिंग दी विजाइना प्लस दे विल बी ब्लीडिंग In case of amniotic fluid embolism, everything will be normal on per vaginal examination, right? So with this, let us see. Your patient had breathlessness. जैसे ये word पढ़ो breathlessness and hypotension, tachycardia and collapse. It means they are talking about amniotic fluid embolism. Per vaginal examination is normal. and there is no excessive blood loss this means they are talking about amniotic fluid embolism agar ye pph hota to ye ex no excessive blood loss na diya hota right in case of pph patient will go into shock only after excessive blood loss if it would have been uterine inversion on per vaginal examination you would have felt a a cup like you would have felt a rounded mass in the vagina in case of dic there would have been excessive blood loss this means that this is a case of amniotic fluid embolism the first phase of amniotic fluid embolism clear to all of you yes okay next question again related to an obstetrical emergency obstetrical emergencies are very very important you get a lot of questions on obstetrical emergencies A G2P1 undergoing delivery presents with full dilatation of the cervix. Head of the fetus is at plus one station and membranes are ruptured. After 15 minutes, the head of the baby delivers, but shoulders fail to deliver. The resident on duty gives episiotomy and instructs the nurse to call for help. Next step in management is. So, what is the next step in management? tell me what's the next step okay so i'm getting a difference of opinion here some of you are saying a some of you are saying b shoulder dystocia ka management it has to be remembered in a step wise manner right you have to remember it in this order if you are a maro subscriber you know this already the acronym helper where h stands for call for help E stands for give episiotomy. So help हो गया, episiotomy हो गया. Then comes L. L stands for legs maneuver. That is Mac Roberts maneuver. What do you do in Mac Roberts maneuver? You flex the legs of the patient. Rather, you hyper flex the legs of the patient. Right? And this is what is Mac Roberts maneuver. अगर Mac Roberts maneuver fail होता है. then you go to the next step and that is you are going to give supra pubic pressure and then again perform mac roberts maneuver so sabse pehle you perform mac roberts maneuver without supra pubic pressure and if that fails then you go to p that is you give supra pubic pressure and then perform mac roberts maneuver if that also fails then you go for e that is enter and rotate enter and rotate me you are going to take your hands inside and rotate the shoulders simply remember there are two maneuvers which are done by this way woods corkscrew maneuver and rubin two maneuver if that also fails then r that is remove the posterior arm forcefully baby ke posterior arm ko forcefully niche pull karo and then try to deliver the shoulders if that also fails then roll the baby not the baby roll the mother to all four limbs so tell the mother to lie on her all four limbs which is called as gaskin maneuver or all four maneuver and then try to deliver and if that also fails then you go to zavanelli's maneuver which is you push the head baby back and do a cesarean section push the head of the baby back into the uterus followed by a cesarean section so this h e l p e r r this is the acronym and these are the steps in which you have to do in this order 
every maneuver has to be tried only for 30 seconds 30 seconds mein agar shoulder deliver nahi ho rahe hain go to the next maneuver right another very important thing is about mac roberts maneuver that mac roberts maneuver when you are performing which nerve can get injured it is lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh please remember that the most common complication of shoulder dystocia the most common fetal complication of shoulder dystocia is urbs palsy in urbs palsy if they are going to do anatomy and obgy integration they are going to ask you which nerve roots are involved c5 and c6 nerve roots are involved what is the most common maternal complication of shoulder dystocia pph agar baby dead hai then you can do cleidotomy what is cleidotomy you can fracture the clavicle and deliver the baby there is no role of symphyosotomy symphyosotomy means you are dividing the pubic symphysis of the mother so remember this h e l p e r r and your questions on shoulder dystocia will be solved excellent pavitra uh in urbs palsy you get a pulisman tip deformity that's very good right you get a pulisman tips deformity c5 c6 nerve roots are involved so over here the next step will be you have to flex the legs of the patient supra pubic pressure uske baad ka step hai fundal pressure is contra indicated in patients of shoulder dystocia you never do fundal pressure right and cesarean section that is zavanelli's maneuver that's the last step that's always the last step in management of shoulder dystocia so in your question whenever there is a choice between supra pubic pressure and flexing the leg of the patient you are going to choose flexing the leg of the patient first followed by supra pubic pressure clear next very important question all of the following are recommended by who for management of second stage of labor except a very very oftenly repeated question see over here dono cheeze yaad rakho third stage ka management bahut important hai active management of third stage of labor bahut important hai and second stage ka management is very important right i am sure by now all of you on your tips you remember third stage ka management what are the steps in active management of third stage of labor the first step, uh, the first thing is you have to give injection utrotonic to the mother after the delivery of the baby or after the delivery of the shoulder of the baby the second step is you have to go for delayed cord clamping third step is you have to deliver the placenta by controlled cord traction and the fourth step is intermittent assessment of uterine tone intermittent assessment of uterine tone se pehle kya tha earlier it was uterine massage these days it is intermittent assessment of uterine tone which is not included in active management of third stage of labor early cord clamping early cord clamping is never included in active management of third stage of labor now comes management of second stage of labor second stage of labor may who recommends ki there can be position kya position honi chahiye any position according to the patient right any position of her choice please remember in the second stage of labor fundal pressure and routine episiotomy are not recommended by who who says when you are delivering the baby uh, then you are not going to give fundal pressure and while delivery of the fetal head in every patient you are not going to give episiotomy episiotomy has to be given only if it is indicated but what are the other things which it tells are recommended so recommendations are perineal support when you are delivering the head of the baby your one hand should be supporting the perineum number 2 you can put a warm compress at the perineum or you can do a perineal massage why are you doing all this because all this is going to relax the perineal muscles and jab perineal muscles relax ho jayenge to jab baby ka head deliver hoga to chances of perineal tear will be less 
right then who says that initially you should flex the head of the baby and then extend the head of the baby when you initially flex the head of the baby the smaller diameters get delivered and then you extend but that doesn't mean agar hum se pucha jaye ki jab baby ka head deliver hota hai by which movement is the head of the baby delivered so head of the baby is delivered by movement of extension बट इनिशियली हम फ्लेक्स इसलिए करते हैं सो दैट स्मॉलर डायमीटर कम आउट फर्स्ट राइट एंड द लास्ट थिंग विच इट रिकमेंड इज डू नॉट बी इन हरी टू डिलीवर द हेड गो फॉर कंट्रोल्ड डिलीवरी ऑफ द हेड सो दीज आर ऑल द स्टेप्स विच आर रिकमेंडेड बाय डब्ल्यू एच ओ फॉर प्रिवेंटिंग पेरिनियल टीयर ऐसे भी क्वेश्चन आ सकता है या फॉर मैनेजिंग सेकेंड स्टेज ऑफ लेबर please remember this step over here that initially you have to flex the head and then extend along with perineal support that is what is called as retigen maneuver so with one hand you will give perineal support with the other hand you will flex the head and then extend another very important question is which i am not including over here everything about episiotomy everything about episiotomy is important ki mediolateral episiotomy why it is preferred over median episiotomy what are the structures which are cut in a mediolateral episiotomy you should know how to recognize an episiotomy scissors then you also should be well versed with perineal tear ki grading right first degree perineal tear it involves vaginal mucosa second degree ka matlab hai vaginal mucosa and muscles torn थर्ड डिग्री में एनल स्विंक्टर स्टोन सो थ्री ए का मतलब है लेस देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ एक्सटर्नल एनल स्विंक्टर टॉन थ्री बी का मतलब है मोर देन फिफ्टी परसेंट टॉन थ्री सी का मतलब है इंटरनल एंड एक्सटर्नल एनल स्विंक्टर टॉन एंड फोर्थ डिग्री का मतलब है रेक्टल म्यूकोसा टॉन ऑल दिस इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर ऑल ऑफ यू राइट ना I think this is the last question for the day, and then we have some spotters for you. So then I have some spotters which you are going to see and tell me what does that indicate. Already this session is for two hours; it has gone till two hours. So I am not going to take much of your time now. Fifteen more minutes, right? True statement for labor care guide is: Option A, active stage begins at six centimeters. option b alert and action line are present the time duration between the two is 4 hours option c second stage of labor represented option d uterine contractions may strength frequency and duration represented so tell me a b c or d true statement for labor care guide I have started getting your answers. I'm waiting for more answers. So all of you say it's option B. All of you. Anyone with a different option? Someone is saying A. Acha. And otherwise, all of you say it's option B. someone is saying option d okay so ab uh, d and a i have started getting okay which means none of you know anything about labor care guide so yeah that means ki tum log videos nahi dekh rahe ho you are not getting updated with whatever updates i am giving you are not keeping up to date with those updates but you up you know you people feel that being an fmge rajiv ranjan very good abhijit good now i have started getting the correct answer okay so now understand why are updates important see you feel that you are going to give foreign medical exam and that is why updates are not important for you now let me tell you around 2 months back there was uh, the nursing exam jipmer walon ne nursing exam conduct kiya and there was this norset ka nursing exam before that i had given these updates 
right to the nursing students and can you beat it three questions came from update video which i had taken for the nursing students and immediately after that i started getting uh, messages that ma'am three questions came from your session so i don't think so that you people your standard is going to be below the nursing you are much above that bachcho you are a medical graduate so for you people keeping abreast with all the updates is very very important and i have very high um you know a lot of respect for foreign medical graduate students but then i want all of you to have that similar respect for yourself don't degrade your exam don't downgrade yourself don't uh, think low of your exam your exam the level of your exams is gradually increasing so you will have to know all the updates and this is a major update which has come and that is the next generation partogram next generation partogram which is called as the labor care guide i don't know how many of you follow me on my instagram handle which is dr sakshi arora hans on my instagram handle also i have given you update on this that there is a new partogram which has come labor care guide now for you people i'm just repeating it over here that is the new gen next generation partogram which is labor care guide ab abhi tak ka jo partogram tha jo which you were studying in your classes that was modified partogram right and ab jo naya aaya hai that is new na, the labor care guide labor care guide ke naam se aaya hai and this is the next generation partogram in a modified partogram active phase began at 4 cm and that is why plotting began at 4 cm according to labor care guide that means according to latest who guidelines active phase begins at 5 cm so jo ye next generation ka partogram hai which is labor care guide usme plotting begins at 5 cm please remember according to acog active phase begins at 6 cm but according to who's recent recommendations and according to this latest partogram which is labor care guide active phase begins at 5 cm jo isse purane wala partogram tha modified partogram usme active phase began at 4 cm right number 2 in this new partogram there is a lot of focus which is given on individualizing the po intra partum care there are no alert lines there are no action lines alert line and action line was present in the previous partogram which was modified partogram in a modified partogram there were two lines one line was alert line other line was action line and the time duration between them was 4 hours and in modified who partogram alert line kaise banti thi alert line was based on the principle that minimum dilatation in active phase is 1 cm per hour ab who ne ye sara concept hata diya WHO कहता है, it is not necessary that an active phase dilatation should be one centimeter per hour, and that is why जब उसने ये concept ही हटा दिया कि now in active phase dilatation can be less than one centimeter per hour, so obviously the alert line is gone because alert line was based on the fact that alert in active phase minimum dilatation is one centimeter per hour. अब जब ये concept ही नहीं रहा, तो alert line चली गई. and since there is no alert line there is no action line right so in this new partogram there is no alert line there is no action line according to this new partogram active phase may dilatation can be less than 1 cm per hour very very important so there are time based cut off for each centimeter dilatation of the cervix so now there is a time based cut off ab ye general rule nahi hai ki dilatation has to be 1 cm per hour for every dilatation there is a time based cut off in this partogram right jo isse pehle wala partogram tha that is modified partogram in modified partogram second stage of labor was not represented 
right whereas over here the second stage of labor is also represented and monitoring is done with the second stage of labor also and jab bhi female push karna start karti hai it is represented by letter p so these are all differences which are there between uh, the new partogram that is labor care guide and the earlier partogram that is modified who partogram then in the new partogram there is a supportive section and is supportive section mein hum mention karte hain ki pain relief ke liye patient ko kya diya in which posture was delivery conducted because who says delivery can be conducted in any posture how much was the oral fluid intake which was given to the patient please remember who says that oral fluid can be given to a patient during labor but solids avoid karne chahiye right and because who says ki oral fluid diya ja sakta hai that is why it is represented on partogram now that is labor care guide then who makes it mandatory that every female who is delivering should be accompanied by one companion of her choice so you also have to mention there who was the companion who was there during the delivery then comes uterine contraction जो मॉडिफाइड डब्ल्यू एच ओ पार्टोग्राम था उसमें जब हम यूट्राइन कॉन्ट्रैक्शन को रिप्रेजेंट करते थे वी टोल्ड द ड्यूरेशन द फ्रीक्वेंसी एंड द स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ द कॉन्ट्रैक्शन बट नाउ इन दिस न्यू पार्टोग्राम विच इज लेबर केयर गाइड ओनली ड्यूरेशन एंड फ्रीक्वेंसी इज टोल्ड यू डोंट हैव टू मैंशन द स्ट्रेंथ नाउ टेल मी हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू आर अवेयर दैट द अर्लियर मॉडिफाइड डब्ल्यू एच ओ पार्टोग्राम में how was uterine contraction represented and how was the duration represented so uterine contraction ko represent karne ke liye there were boxes each box corresponded to one contraction which happened in 10 minutes so for 10 minutes you had to put your hand on the patient's uterus and you had to count the number of contractions if in 10 minutes there were three contractions you would color three boxes if there were two contractions you would color two boxes not only this the way in which you color told the duration of the contraction so if you colored in dots it meant that the contraction lasted for less than 20 seconds if you made oblique lines it meant that the contraction lasted for 20 to 40 seconds and if you did a solid coloring that means the contraction lasted for more than 40 seconds so number of boxes jo aap color kar rahe ho and how you are coloring told about the duration and frequency of contraction along with that agar hamare paas toko dynamometer available hota tha then we used to measure the strength and we used to write it now they say there is no need to write the strength you just have to follow the same principle about duration and frequency clear to all of you so these are the differences between modified who partogram and who's labor care guide this is there on my instagram handle you can go and read it from there also right this is a table which i want all of you to quickly take a screenshot i don't have much time so i am going to just wanting all of you to take a screenshot of this table where i have written a core you know the stages of labor their average duration and their maximum duration over here please understand ki jo who ka latest hai jo modified ka matlab jo latest hai it is according to the latest thing who says that the dilatation can be less than 1 cm per hour so who says in active phase now the dilatation can be less than 1 cm per hour earlier who kehta tha ki minimum dilatation should be 1 cm per hour but now it says it can be less than 1 cm per hour modified who guidelines these are the new guidelines based on which labor care guide is made older who guidelines was that the latent phase was up till 3 cm right so latent phase was up till 3 cm and active phase began at 4 cm 
नाउ डब्ल्यू एच ओ की जो लेटेस्ट है वो ये कहता है कि नाउ डब्ल्यू एच ओ से लेटेस्ट गाइडलाइन से कि एक्टिव फेज बिगिन एट फाइव सेंटीमीटर पहले डब्ल्यू एच ओ कहता था कि एक्टिव फेज बिगिन एट फोर सेंटीमीटर नाउ इट सेज दैट एक्टिव फेज बिगिन एट फाइव सेंटीमीटर ए सी ओ जी क्या कहता है दैट एक्टिव फेज बिगिन एट सिक्स सेंटीमीटर ऑल दीज थ्री थिंग्स यू हैव टू रिमेम्बर कि जो प्रीवियस वाला पार्टोग्राम था विच वॉज कॉल्ड एज मॉडिफाइड डब्ल्यू एच ओ पार्टोग्राम विच वॉज बेस्ड ऑन ओल्डर गाइडलाइंस वहां पे एक्टिव फेस बिगैन एट फोर सेंटीमीटर्स जो लेटेस्ट डब्ल्यू एच ओ की रिकमेंडेशन है जिसपे लेबर केयर गाइड इज बेस्ड ऑन वो कहता है कि एक्टिव फेस बिगिन एट फाइव सेंटीमीटर्स एंड ए सी ओ जी से इज दैट एक्टिव फेस बिगिन एट सिक्स सेंटीमीटर्स राइट so don't get uh, you know confused by modified who guidelines instead you can remember latest who guidelines because modified term so you can get confused modified term use hota hai modified who partogram bolte hain modified who partogram older guidelines pe based tha right and jo naya partogram aaya hai next generation partogram wo latest guidelines pe based hai so you instead of writing modified who guidelines write it as latest who guidelines clear so this all is over here i want all of you to take a screenshot of this table this is a very very important table about stages of labor spotters in spotters this image a this is a snowstorm appearance which is seen on ultrasound and on in the uterus and this particular snowstorm appearance you get in case of complete mole image b over here is cannon ball appearance which you get in case of chorio carcinoma when chorio carcinoma has metastasized to the lungs please remember whenever chorio carcinoma metastasizes to the lungs that is stage 3 and the most common presentation of chorio carcinoma metastasis is uh is a cannon ball appearance and if cannon ball appearance is not there then on chest x ray the second most common appearance is snowstorm appearance right then over here is again i am saying image a and b and you have to tell me in this spotter how are you going to identify which one is uterine inversion and which one is uterine prolapse so tell me a and b may say which one is uterine inversion and which one is uterine prolapse quickly i'm waiting for your answers how are you going to tell me which one is uterine inversion image of uterine inversion and which one is the image of prolapse okay so again i've started getting varied answers over here so you are going to recognize with the help of the os if os is visible it means it is prolapse if os is not visible then that means that is uterine inversion clear simple funda os is visible it's prolapse os not visible it is inversion tell me which instrument is this quickly a spotter which instrument and where it is used this is a carmen cannula very good right and what size carmen cannula are you going to pick up for doing suction evacuation this is used for suction evacuation suction evacuation when is it done it is done between 7 to 12 weeks of pregnancy right and the size of carmen's cannula should correspond to the period of gestation right then uh, what is the intra uterine pressure which is generated during carmen uh, during suction evacuation 600 mm of mercury that is the pressure which is generated while doing suction evacuation okay now tell me which is this spotter what is this ultrasound image showing you see the spotter over here what is this ultrasound image showing you this image is a double decidual sac sign 
Double decidual sac sign is seen in case of intrauterine pregnancy. Prasan, this is not double bleb sign. Double bleb sign may, if you go to the revision videos which I am taking on my channel, I have shown you there. Double bleb sign may, you will see a gestational sac and gestational sac may, you will see two bubbles. Here, what you are seeing is a gestational sac which is surrounded by two ring-like structures. One ring is this ring, which is pointed, which is the inner arrow, the thinner arrow is pointing. And the other one is this ring, which a thicker arrow is pointing. So, the inner wali ring, hai, this is decidua capsularis. And the bahar wali ring, hai, this is decidua parietalis. So, this is double decidual sac sign or double decidual ring sign. Clear? <clears throat> This is double bleb sign. Double bleb sign may one is yolk sac and the other one is amniotic sac. Clear? Okay. Now tell me what are these instruments? A, B and C. A is Iyer's spatula. B is endocervical brush. And C is a cervical brush or a cervical broom, which is used for liquid-based cytology. It is used for liquid-based cytology. That is liquid-based pap smear. These two are used for conventional pap smear. Right? With the Ayers spatula, you are going to take sample from transformation zone. With endocervical brush, you are going to take sample from endocervix. Both these samples are put on a single slide, right? And you are not going to air dry the slide. And what is the fixative which is used? Fixative which is used is 95% ethyl alcohol plus minus 5% ether. Ether can be given in your options. It may not be given in your options, right? What is this spotter over here? So what spotter can you see over here? What are you seeing over here? You are seeing some mass and you are seeing hair in it. You are seeing teeth in it. Whenever you get a mass where you are seeing hair and teeth, that means it's a teratoma and this is a dermoid cyst, right? A dermoid cyst is a yolk sac tumor of the ovary, right? Very, very important is dermoid cyst. What is that area, raised area from which these elements arise? That is called as Rokintansky protuberance, right? Which is the most common benign tumor of the ovary? It's a dermoid cyst. Dermoid cyst is the most common benign tumor of the ovary. It is the most common tumor to undergo torsion during pregnancy. And because dermoid cyst can undergo torsion, that is why we have to remove it. Gestational no bacha. Gestational sac sign cannot differentiate between intrauterine and ectopic pregnancy. It cannot. For more details, uh, you will have to go through the revision video part one, which I have put on my channel for all the FMG students. Now, what is this spotter over here? Again, in this spotter, this is image A, this is image B. Now, in image A, what I'm seeing, I'm seeing one twin, I'm seeing second twin, right? But And over here, again, one twin sac, the second twin sac. Right. But the difference is over here, I am seeing that the placenta is coming in between the two twins in the form of a peak. Right. This is what is called as twin peak sign positive or this is called as lambda sign positive. And this is seen in dichorionic diamniotic twin pregnancy. Over here, this is the placenta and placenta is not coming in between the twins. And that means this is twin peak sign negative 
and this means this is monochorionic twins because i am seeing a thin membrane over here this means this is monochorionic monoamniotic if no membrane would have been seen monochorionic uh, sorry this is monochorionic diamniotic and if no membrane would have been seen it would have been monochorionic monoamniotic you don't have to worry about whether it is monochorionic diamniotic or monochorionic uh, monoamniotic you simply have to you know uh, recognize the twin peak sign twin peak sign if it is present it is dichorionic if twin peak sign is absent that is monochorionic that is more than sufficient for you when do you do ultrasound to determine chorionicity between 11 to 13 weeks so you will have to do ultrasound between 11 to 13 weeks to detect chorionicity right then identify the fetal presentation now this is a question which all of you tend to make mistakes with now this is very very important now over here first thing what you have to do is you have to identify where the occiput will be right so somewhere here will be the occiput of the baby this over here is pubic symphysis over there will be the sacral promontory now first thing first tell me where is the occiput facing is the occiput towards pubic symphysis more or is it towards sacral promontory more this is more towards pubic symphysis this means this is occipito anterior position if it would have been more towards sacral promontory i would have said occipito posterior but just now the occiput is more towards pubic symphysis so this is occipito anterior position now whenever you get a question like this please remember when we are conducting vaginal delivery we are looking towards the face of the mother so my left is mother's right my right is mother's left so in this image occiput is towards your left or towards your right it is towards your left so if it is towards your left it will be mother's right so this is going to be right occipito anterior position now if you get a question like this where they have shown you the occiput it's very easy sometimes they may give you a question like this where they have not shown you where the occiput is but all of you know that occiput is lying just above the posterior fontanel sorry just below the posterior fontanel and posterior fontanel is the triangular looking fontanel right so posterior fontanel ke just niche is the occiput and posterior fontanel is the triangular looking fontanel so if you get an image like this look where is the triangular looking fontanel is it towards pubic symphysis is it towards sacral promontory or is it in the center so i can see that the triangular looking fontanel is exactly in the center that means it is occipito transverse if it would have been towards pubic symphysis i would have said occipito anterior if it would have been towards sacral promontory i would have said occipito posterior but it is in the center so it is occipito transverse now tell me whether it is towards your right or towards your left it is towards your right it is towards my right in other words it is mother's left so this is left occipito transverse position clear to all of you very very important image then the next important image is the leopold menuvers image very very important all of you know that there are four leopold's menuvers first three are done while you face the face of the patient in the first menuver which is called as the fundal grip your hands are going to be on the fundus of the uterus and it tells you about the lie because if this fundal grip is empty it means it's transverse lie if something is present that means it's longitudinal lie now also it tells you about the presentation agar hame upar ki taraf something soft uh, feeling aa rahi hai broad feeling aa rahi hai that means buttocks are present up in other words it is cephalic presentation and agar upar hame hard rounded globular structure mil raha hai it means head is present up that means it is breech presentation then comes this then from the fundus you move your hands towards the lateral side and that is what is called as lateral grip or umbilical grip lateral grip or umbilical grip tells you about the position of the baby right then 
you bring your single hand towards the pelvic area that is the third maneuver which is called as pollic grip pollic grip tells you about the presentation plus it tells you whether the head of the baby is fixed or floating agar baby ka head move ho sakta hai from one side to other side that means it has not yet entered the pelvis and if it cannot be moved that means it has entered the pelvis right then comes the fourth menu of uh, the fourth leopold's maneuver which is called as deep pelvic grip for deep pelvic grip you are now going to face the feet of the patient and with your two hands you are going to keep them parallel to the inguinal area and you are going to feel what you are getting in the pelvic area so it confirms the findings of the third grip so it is again going to tell you about presentation it is also going to tell you whether the head of the baby has gone down into the pelvis or not plus it tells you one more thing and that is attitude of the baby so deep pelvic grip tells you everything what third grip tells you right so which what the third maneuver tells you that is the pollic grip tells you along with that it also tells you about the attitude of the fetus clear to all of you yes then uh, important images are maneuvers in breech these are very very important images number one image which you are seeing over here you are giving traction to the groin area so this is groin traction which is done for delivery of buttocks in case of a flexed breech right then you have second maneuver which you are seeing over here is pinard maneuver in pinard maneuver finger is being taken up till the popliteal fossa so p for pinard p for popliteal fossa if you see fingers being taken up till the popliteal fossa that is a pinard maneuver which is done for delivery of legs in case of frank breach right then comes the another maneuver where you are seeing ki hands are kept on the back of the baby baby ke legs deliver ho chuke hain now we have kept hands on the back of the baby and we are trying to rotate the baby so that the shoulder of the baby delivers this is called as lovsets maneuver which is for shoulder delivery right and then comes the last part to be delivered in breech is head and that is why it is called as after coming head of breech for delivery of head you can let the baby hang by its own weight then you can take the legs towards the mother's abdomen this is what is called as burn marshal technique please remember in a normal vaginal delivery head of the baby is delivered by movement of extension but in case of breech head of the baby is delivered by movement of flexion what is the most common cause of death in breech intracranial hemorrhage right there is another way for delivering the head of the baby and that is malar flexion shoulder traction isme kya dikh raha hai isme you are seeing two fingers are kept on the cheek of the baby and two fingers of the other hand are put on the shoulder and you are doing malar flexion shoulder traction right so your one hand fingers will be on the cheek of the baby other hand fingers will be on the shoulder another name for this is this is what is malar flexion shoulder traction right this is also what is called as morisio smiley wheat technique right so this is a, a technique by which you can deliver the head of the baby a third way of delivering the head of the baby in breech is by using a forceps which is called as piper's forceps now in all these methods the back of the baby is anterior in other words it is these are methods for delivery of dorso anterior breech but agar maan lo it's a dorso posterior breech and head ki delivery karani hai then in that case the maneuver which you use is preg maneuver only the name preg maneuver so these were the three methods number 1 burn marshal number 2 morisio smiley we technique number 3 piper forceps these were three methods for delivery of head in dorso anterior breech can you see over here 
in all these cases, the back of the baby is facing anteriorly, right? But if the back of the baby is facing posteriorly and I have to deliver the head of the baby, then the maneuver which you use is Prague, P R A G U E, Prague maneuver. No need to know the details, just this much for Prague's maneuver, right? Now, last thing which you have to know two very important scores in OBGY. In me se jarur question aata hai. One is Bishop score. And I'm sure you know Bishop score is for induction of labor. And what are the parameters which are used for Bishop score? As far as FMG exam is concerned, you don't need to know how to calculate the score. You just need to know what are the parameters which are included in Bishop's score. That is Delhi Police Employed Special Compandos, where D stands for dilatation of the cervix, P stands for position of cervix, E stands for effacement, S stands for station of fetal head, and C stands for consistency of the cervix. Now, a total score, the maximum is 13. If score is more than equal to 9, that means there is maximum success for induction of labor. And if score is less than equal to 5, then that is a poor score. Right? Now, uh, so bishop score is important. Now, there is something which is called as modified bishop score. In modified bishop score, effacement of cervix is replaced by length of cervix, right? So this parameter effacement ki jagah, there is length of cervix, right? And length of the cervix ko measure karne ke liye, you will have to do TVS. In other words, bishop score ke liye, there is no need for doing a TVS. It's a clinical score. Modified bishop score ke liye, you need to do a TVS or an ultrasound because in modified bishop score, we look at the uh, we look at the cervical length. Pavitra, yes. For neat PG, you have to know how to calculate the score because they give you a condition and they will ask you what is the bishop score. FMG, ke liye, no need to remember the calculation, but for uh, neat PG, it is very, very important for you to know how to calculate bishop score, right? Then a second score, which is very important for all of you, is biophysical score or Manning score, which is done for 30 minutes by ultrasound. When do you do a biophysical score or a Manning score? So suppose a female comes to you with uh, decreased fetal movements. So when a female comes to you, Ek minute, uh, Mr. Serotonin, just wait, just hold on to your doubt. I'll just now come to that. First, let me complete what I'm telling. Whenever a female comes to you with decreased fetal movement, so if a pregnant female complains of decreased fetal movement and they ask you what is the next step? So next step is a screening test, right? And what is that screening test? The best answer would be modified biophysical score. Agar ye option mein nahi diya hai, then the second best answer is NST, right? Remember, modified biophysical score, mein, there are only two parameters at which you look. One is NST, the other is amniotic fluid volume, right? And in me se agar koi bhi test abnormal aega, then you go for diagnostic test and the diagnostic test is biophysical score, right? Biophysical score is a diagnostic test. Modified biophysical score is a screening test. Modified biophysical score, mein, there are only two parameters, NST and amniotic fluid volume. Biophysical score, mein, there are five parameters. TB meningitis always notorious, where T stands for fetal tone. And when we have biophysical score or Manning score, we have to do, then you have to do ultrasound for 30 minutes. And in that 30 minutes, you have to note how was the fetal tone? How are you going to note how was the fetal tone? If there is one more than equal to one movement of extension and flexion, you will give a score of plus two. Ek bar bhi baby ka in 30 minutes, move hand bent out for flexion, extension and flexion, you will give a score of plus two. Then comes breathing movement. So if in a period of 30 minutes, there is one episode of breathing, actually that breathing is chest wall movement. So if there is even one episode of chest wall movement, I will give a score of plus two. 
then in a period of 30 minutes if there are three gross body movements i will give a score of plus 2 then i will look at the single largest vertical pocket if there is single largest vertical pocket if it is 2 cm pocket i will give a score of plus 2 i will do an nst and if nst may i am getting two or more than two accelerations i will give a score of plus 2 so maximum score which you can get is 10 by 10 so if you are getting a score of 10 by 10 that means the baby is absolutely fine clear so for all the fmgs you just need to know biophysical score or banning score what are the parameters what are there in biophysical score or banning score uska interpretation you don't need to know similarly for bishop score you need to know what is what is there in bishop score and score agar more than 9 hai to kya matlab hai score if it is less than 5 what does that mean clear now if neat pg students are watching this video you also need to know one more score and that is who's scoring for corio carcinoma that's very very important who scoring system for gestational trophoblastic neoplasia right okay uh, mohit important physiological changes important physiological changes for fmg are cardiac changes very very important hematological changes very very important and respiratory changes right uh shri lakshmi is it enough to do sixth edition revision videos and mcq discussion for fmg now if you are going to rely only on revision videos and mcq discussion then i would say that do revision videos mcq discussion plus today's session whatever i have told in today's session and there are three four sessions which i am taking on youtube for all the fmg students before you give your exam watch those sessions that will be more than enough uh yes wish uh, there was some technical issue which happened while i was uh, delivering this youtube lecture edition th uh, part 3 ops part 3 so i couldn't save that video i will i will again do a live uh, ops part 3 video on my uh, youtube channel then you and i'll save it also for all of you right any other questions which you have now i am quickly taking you through for list 1 of ops so these are the topics which you have to take a screenshot these are the topics which are highly essential for ops in ops for fmg exam you keep a list you know take a print out of this list right and the moment these topics are done put a tick around them right just tick them out that i have done all these topics be sure that each one is ticked before you attempt your fmg exam right this is list 1 list 1 means most important then this is list 2 once you've done list 1 then these are the topics which you are going to do iske alawa don't do anything just now in ops right list 3 i am not showing you because you don't have time so don't do list 3 just first do list 1 and then do this list 2 right then gynae list 1 these are the topics for gynae list 1 most important topics for gynae right once you take a print out of this list just put a tick mark the moment you cover all these topics so this is gynae list 1 and this over here is gynae list 2 iske alawa do nothing in ops and gynae now if you are a maro subscriber let me clearly tell you how you are going to prepare if you have done ops from fmg uh, ops from edition 5 simply you are going to watch revision videos of edition 6 today's class and mcq discussions that's more than enough for ops nothing is going to come beyond it if you have not watched any uh, video of obs and gynae till now and you are a maro subscriber in that case watch the revision videos watch the mcq discussion videos watch today's session and uske baad is list se compare karo if there is any topic which is not being covered in from those three things today's session from uh, obs uh from uh, mcq discussion and from revision videos of edition 6 then that particular topic video you should watch right so all the best to all of you 
See, but you, you didn't come this far to come only this far, right? You have come this far because all of you want to clear your FMG and not just FMG. You all have to clear your NEAT PG as well. And that is why I want all of you, you know, to be ma making the best use of this time and giving your best shot this year. All the best to all of you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.